Good morning, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Brother, I have received your emails. I'm going to be getting a hold of you um, via email uh, as soon as we're done with this. Um, oh, brethren. There's a lot of our brothers who are going through some extraordinary hardships right now. Pray for the brethren. Pray for the brethren. This video um, I will consider to be a collaborated effort. A brother sent me a link to this, um, about this. Um, actually, Pretty fascinating. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to make mention of the brother's name. Uh, I did not ask him permission for that. Um, if if he wishes to be made known, he brother, you can do that. But um, like I said, a brother sent me this link. Oh, and brother, use Mesa Boogie. But a brother sent me this link, and this is actually pretty fascinating, okay? Um, and this is talking about um, Osiris, the Osiris um, heresy, the Osiris legend, the Osiris myth, the Osiris religion, okay? And um, this has, this is very pertinent to do with a lot of the stuff that we are seeing today. I want to start with a verse of scripture. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please follow me along word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures we will be looking at today. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Follow me along. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Search the scriptures with me, okay? I'm going to start out with a verse of scripture which our, which our brother provided. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1. In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon... That is in the sea. Now, Leviathan. That ties in with the book of Job. When uh, our Lord does, uh, speaks, uh, gives a discourse about Leviathan. Okay? And also, the dragon that is in the sea. Oh, it's a Loch Ness monster. Um, the dragon. That old serpent. The devil. Satan. And this is also a reference... You can check your reference in your scriptures if you have it about uh, Revelation chapter 17. Okay, Revel go there. Go to where we're going. Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And also with what we just looked at in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, you can tie in with um, Tyrus, or not Tyrus, um, yeah, yeah, uh, Tyrus, King of Tyrus in uh, Ezekiel's chapters 27 and 28, okay? About the dragon, Satan, all right? But we are going to be the link for this video. Scientists just found the tomb of the Egyptian god Osiris next to the River Nile. Hmm. The link for this video will be in the description box for you to watch at your own time. This is a 28 minute video. We are not going to go through the entirety of this video. But we are, we are going to address some points within this video. And when it comes to right down to it, brethren, we have to remember a few things. Roman Catholicism, the religion of Roman Catholicism, is the perfection, is the perfection of the Babylonian religion. 
you might be saying to me, well, well, Brad, this Egypt, Egypt was for Babylon and stuff. Not so. Not so. Not so. Now, we, uh, you know what? Um, yeah, for the for the time being here, let me uh, let me let me get this here because okay, I'll tell you what, brethren, trying to operate this OBS thing is can be quite confusing. You might be saying to me, "Well, Egypt came before Babylon. It's the Egyptian religion. It is. It goes as follows, brethren." It began with Babylon. It got, took its form in Egypt. It has reached its perfection in Roman Catholicism. What is the it? The religion of Satan himself. The Babylonian religion, which is today Roman Catholicism. Okay? Roman Catholicism is the perfection of the Babylonian religion. You might say to me again, but Brad, this has to do with Egypt. Yes, it does. Like I said, it had its birth in Babylon. It took its forms in Egypt. And it has reached its perfection in Roman Catholicism. Some of you might be arguing, well, well what about the Masons? What about the Masons? Okay. The Masons are just another division of Satan and his uh, church, Roman Catholicism. Okay. People will argue, well, the Masons were around before Roman Catholicism. The, even in the, 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 in the scriptures, the Masons with Solomon. Those were actual brick Masons, yes. Uh, does that mean that the Masons, as spake, uh, talked about by Manly Palmer Hall? Uh, no, no, no. But, you know, also on this, you got to be careful with this stuff, brethren, but... If you really want to know uh, more about this, this whole Osiris thing, okay? Lord had me to do a video where we talked about it, and I can't remember which one it was, okay? But besides, uh, some of the video that we're going to be watching, this guy actually goes over the basics of it, okay? But if you really want to know about this kind of stuff, okay, I'm going to recommend to you a couple of books. Number one. The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Okay. This is a wealth of information. Um, this is very definitive, except for uh, certain people who want to hold on to their Roman Catholic traditions, then they discard this. <laughs> I recommend you get this book. This is a very um, interesting, informative book uh, by Alexander Hislop. Uh, there are some uh, weird things in here towards the end of the book. But um, his facts, his sources that he gives about the Babylonian religion, which is today Roman Catholicism. Very good book. When you go, if you seek to get this book, beware. Get the unabridged version. What is that? Unabridged. Has everything in it. The version that you can get from Smiley Dave... A Chick Publications is abridged. Get the unabridged version. Okay? The one that you can get from Smiley Dave doesn't have all the information in it. Stay away from that. Get the unabridged version. Okay? I actually have two of these. I have this one. I got this for a couple of brethren um, and gave it to them. I got this one. And I also have what is called uh, considered a study edition of this. Okay? Very informative, very informative. Also, if you really, really want to know about this stuff, and be careful with this, one of the best uh, sources on the whole Osiris um, occultic kind of thing, you know, like I said, be very careful with this, okay? Because you can get messed up with this, and this can consume you, okay? Okay? I keep it because this is what I've been called to do. This is what the Lord has put me. This is what the Lord wants me to do. So being in this position, kind of got to know a little something about it. Okay. But for you, if you, the, Manly Palmer Hall's The Secret Teaching of All Ages, be very careful with this. But if you really want to know about um, Osiris, okay, and also too, I've shown this one, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Uh, when it comes to this 
stuff, uh, Manly Palmer Hall is actually the expert on it. I mean, he really is. He really is. But he, uh, like I said, he gets into all the details much more than what this guy does. But what this guy does in the video is enough for you to know, okay? Like I said, uh, definitely pick this up. This is worth your time. This is worth you getting. The unabridged version. Stay away from the one that Smiley Dave is uh, selling you, okay? If you must, if you want to, I don't recommend, but if you want to, here, okay? The stuff by Manly Palmer Hall, okay? You got to be real careful with Manly Palmer Hall. He's very smooth. He's very smooth. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. And when you get to the 30s in Freemasonry, they know that they are worshiping Satan. Lucifer. You know, son of the morning. Okay? Manly Palmer Hall was a legitimate Satanist. Why wasn't he a Roman Catholic? He basically was. He basically was. Okay? All right? Catholicism runs... Freemasonry. There was a time in history, there was a time, when Freemasons and the Jesuits, Catholicism, butted heads. That has long since passed. Okay, The Jesuits have infiltrated Masonry. Okay, The low-level Masons don't know. Mr. Manley Palmer Hall himself, even is like, yeah, yeah, the Jesuits run us, more or less. <laughs> okay, even Manly Palmer Hall admitted to such, okay, the Jesuits own the Freemasons, okay, all right, you have to remember that, yes, there was a time when they butted heads, yes, that is long gone, okay, remember, Brother Alberto Rivera gave uh, testimony that um, the Black Pope, the head of all Catholicism himself, was a Freemason, okay, and see, Satan wants you to believe to take away attention from his church, Catholicism. Satan wants you to believe that it's the Masons. The Masons are controlled by free. Uh, the Masons are controlled by the Jesuit order. Okay, do not be deceived on that. Okay, you go for the head of the snake. Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism. He wants you. Satan wants you to deal with the parts of the body. When talking about subjects like this, you go for the head, Roman Catholicism, the perfection of the Babylonian religion, okay? Do not forget that, all right? And see, a lot of his ministers will like to distract you by taking away attention from the head, okay? You'll probably see that as a reaction to this video by certain people, even, Okay, <laughs> trying to take away attention from the head. Okay, but let's uh, deal with this about, well, Egypt came first. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Go to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. Okay, before we get to the video, we have to go through this. Okay, Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 on to verse 10. This is after the flood. Okay. After the flood. Before the flood, the world was different. Before the flood, oxygen was more pure. Before the flood, people lived to be a thousand years old. Okay? Before the flood, things were different. Okay? After the flood, everything done changed. The atmosphere changed. Uh, grapes. Noah became a husband. Uh, was, was involved in husbandry. He got drunk. Snuckered. Because... Fermentation was a lot quicker uh, because of the change in atmosphere because of the flood that shaped the earth and the flood that gave us the Grand Canyon. Okay? Just like that. You, you, you stupid evolutionists. And I'm being polite when I say that. Okay? But, okay? But, Babylon came first. All that we are dealing with today stems from Babylon, okay? Prove it to you. About to. Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 on to verse 10. And the sons of Ham, one of the three of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, the Asiatics, the Hebraic people, came from Shem, okay? Shem, 
the Chinese, Japanese, the Koreans, uh, some of the, uh, um, uh, like in Thailand, okay? We don't know, I don't know about the Mongolians, uh, I don't know. Um, the Indians of America, okay? Those of Shem dwelt in tents. Those of Shem built temples, okay? Ham! Ham! Okay? And who was the offspring of Ham? Canaan. Okay? Ham! The Egyptians, the Africans. Of Ham comes what? Pyramids. Okay? Well, what about us Japhethians? What about us, us Japhethians? We just spread out. <laughs> we spread out. Okay? And we're going to look at that uh, in Genesis chapter 9, but we're going to get to this first, okay? But we, we spread out, and we dwell in the tents of Shep, okay? All right? All right, but Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 on verse 10. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. Canaan. The sons of Cush, Sheba and Havilah, and Sapta, and Rama, and Sapteka, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Didan, and Cush begat Nimrod. Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel, Babel. Okay, I'm an American. All right, I'm saying Babel. All right? Okay, uh, I know it may be Babel according to true English. I'm an American. See, unlike the Shemitic people of Japan who like to take the things of all the world and try to make it their own and tweak it to make it better, I'm an American. We like to take everything of the world and mess it up. <laughs> but, Babel. I'm going to say Babel. All right? And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel, Babel, whatever. And Erech and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. The Lord had me to do a video where we touched on this, and I can't remember which one. I can't. Okay? I can't. But, Babel. Babylon. Okay? This is before Egypt. All right? Now, what, what, are the, what does Babylon do? Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 9. We're going to read what God says about what happens with ecumenicalism. Yeah. Genesis 11, verses 1 on verse 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, the land of Babylon. Okay. The kingdom of Nimrod. Okay? And they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. See, this is why our Father, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, loves variety. He loves variety. We are mankind. But there is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? And there are variations within those kindreds. Okay? Some people take that a little too crazy. And they get a little too into it. Okay? They do. All right? To the point where they're almost arguing about genealogies, which the scriptures is like, hey, be a little bit more simple with it. That's my, that's the way I look at it. Shem was Shem, 
Ham with ham, Japheth with Japheth, simple. Okay? God loves variety. But God loves distinction. People, you got to get I you, you gotta get that through your head. Okay? There are many horses, but there are different kinds of horses. There are different uh, cats, but there are there are cats, but there are different kinds of cats. Okay? There are dogs. But unfortunately there are chihuahuas. I don't like chihuahuas. Okay? They're not all the same. They are all dogs. They are all cats. We are all man. But there are differences. And God loves variety. And God wants those separates. Okay? He does. He does. All right? He, he determined the bound of their habitation. That's even in Acts chapter 17, I believe. Please, someone in the comment section put that there. Brother, okay? All right? God is a God of distinction. All right? But what does Satan like to do in his kingdom? You look at the ecumenical movement, which this is stemming about, okay? And when everybody gets together, what happens? We want to think we are gods and we want to make temples uh, that reach unto heaven to make a name for ourselves. It's, it's dangerous when everybody gets together like that. Okay? God wants people separate. Okay? Shem with Shem, Ham with Ham, Japheth with Japheth. Okay? You really don't need to get as picky as some of these people do. Okay? Eric John Phelps, uh, for for example, he got pretty picky about it, and so did several others. Be, be simple with it. Shem with Shem, Ham with Ham, Japheth with Japheth. Simple. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with this, <coughs> which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, People is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And the imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. The Lord is right there in verse 6 telling, saying like, if we all get together like that, like in Genesis 11, There's no telling what we can come up with. And see, Satan wants to tell you that's good. Our Father tells you that's not good. Now, you might right now be wanting to confuse and blur salvation with culture. Because in salvation, come on, what are you saying right now? Well, we're all one in Jesus. You're right. You are right. We're all one in Jesus Christ. You are right. Salvitically, as pertaining to salvation. Today, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, barbarian, Scythian, bond free. Okay? There is no distinction in salvation. You're right. You're right. And that, okay? Hamitic brethren, you're of Ham. You're saved, born again, converted to the Church of the Living God. You're my brother. Okay? Shh, you're of Shem. Or a Hebrew. Okay? A Hebrew's taken out of Shem. Not Ham. Okay? Hebrews came out of Shem. Okay? You're of Shem. You're saved, born again, converted to the Church of the Living God. You're my brother or my sister or whatever. Okay? In salvation, there's no distinction. Culturally, there are differences. There are differences. Yes, we all have red blood in our body. Yes, we do. But there are differences. And God loves variety. You're going to have to deal with that. Okay? While Satan wants everybody to come together. When God wants people separate. We're not talking about salvation. Don't blur that line. That is a tactic of the devil. Don't do that. Okay? Salvation is salvation. There's no distinction. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Culturally, there's a difference. Okay? Okay? You're going to have to deal with that, friend. Verse 7. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. There's a difference between confuse and confound. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city. The city was not destroyed. They just quit building it. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, confound, confound. There's a difference between confound and confusion. Things that are different are not the same. <laughs> okay. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Mm -hmm. Another example we can acknowledge is um, the apostles, the disciples. You know, they, unless the Lord allowed a little, it's like, hey, you're, you're, you're supposed to go out in all the world. You're all just hunkering there. Go, 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 go. Okay, here, here's a little persecution. Then they went out, okay? That's another one that you could uh, bring up that the uh, apostles and the disciples early on of the Church of the Living God, they would have probably just stayed hunkered there waiting for, you know, the, 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 for the redemption of the purchased possession. Just waiting there. The Lord's like, oh, you, you, you got a job to do. Okay, get out there. Go. Okay. You can make that argument. You can bring that up as also as a comparison of types. Okay. But now, like uh, we made mention, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9, verses 25 on to verse 27. Genesis chapter 9, verses 25 on to verse 27. Noah, after he get, he wakes up from his wine, getting schnuckered drunk, and he finds out that his son, that Canaan, um, made, mocked him. You know, he saw... Uh, Noah naked, and he's like, hey guys, come here, look at this, you gotta see this, look at this, ha 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 okay, beware of people trying to tell you that there was some grotesque sexual figure, Satan, and his ministers, okay, there was nothing sexual involved here, the Lord rebuke you, you don't know that? Uh, if I can remember, the truth about Ham's real sin will be in the description box. There was nothing sexual here, okay? What happened was he saw Noah naked and made fun of him and was telling other people, it's like, ha, 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 look at this. He didn't honor him, okay? That's what happened, all right? Beware of people trying to turn this into some perverse, perverse sexual thing. There's nothing sexual there, okay? Beware. Okay, that's a minister of Satan. And he said, Noah, after you read verse 24, and let's read verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Canaan which came of Ham. Okay, Ham. From Ham comes Babylon. Babel. Okay, I'm look, my Hamitic brethren, I love you. <laughs> okay? Okay? That that's that's scripture. Okay? Okay? That doesn't make you lesser of a brother or a sister. God forbid, no. But the fact is, is the fact is. Okay? Of Ham came the Babylonian religion. That's scripture. That's scripture, okay? And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Shem. And out of Shem comes the Hebraic people. And of the Hebraic people, is it not evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah? Okay? Okay? The God of Shem, 
who is our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Hebrews, and also of the Gentiles. Yes, of the Gentiles also. Okay? Okay? And Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Unfortunately, now Canaan was of him, okay? Okay? Unfortunately, people, you know, our Japhethian ancestors, slave owners here of uh, Masonic Jesuit, Jesuit America, you know, the Masonic, you know, people who gave us that Masonic document there uh, were slave owners. And some even came to right there to try to justify it. And yes, my hermetic brethren, I understand that's a bone of contention for you, for some of you. I am of Japheth myself. But I never once enslaved one of you of Ham. Okay? All right? Even the scripture says, the son shall not be punished for the sins of the fathers and vice versa. Okay? All right? Just, just saying. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. So, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? Japheth spread out per capita. See, people will like to, because of China and the, you know, China's boom of populace, per capita, I believe Japheth has more than Shem. Okay? And Gog and Magog is both Japheth and Shem. Okay? You got to remember that. Okay? Gog and Magog, they say it's China and Russia, Russia, the Rus, Viking, okay? We can, see, you can get really, really deep into this kindred stuff, and you just got to keep it simple, okay? Okay? But the point of is why we come from this, okay? It began with Babylon. The religion of Babylon, okay? And Nimrod's wife, with Semiramis, scripturally referred to as the Queen of Heaven. Okay? And Nimrod had a son, according to Alexander Hislop and even Manly Palmer Hall. Nimrod had a son before he died. And his son was Ninus. Okay? And Semiramis, because her husband was dead, she took over and started to, you know, to, to be the queen of heaven, okay? Uh, you'll see some pictures of Mary, that she has like a tower on her head, a builder of fortresses. That's what Semiramis is. See, the Roman Catholic Mary is the queen of heaven, which is talked against in the book of Jeremiah, also known as Semiramis, okay? And Semiramis married her son, Ninus. And that produced Tammuz, okay? You're going to see this within the video, okay? But see, it all began in Babylon, okay? Building towers, the land of Shinar and stuff like that, okay? It began in Babylon. It was formulated, came to form in Egypt. You, Some might say it was perfected in Egypt. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. The perfection of the Babylonian Egyptian religion is Roman Catholicism. That is the perfection of Satan's religion. Okay? And we, as the Church of the Living God, you and I, we have some very stern warnings about this. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. I know we haven't gotten to the video yet, but we have to go through this, okay? When this is uploaded, skip to the video if you got to. Uh, you, you should listen to this because uh, this is pertinent. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 on to verse 32. 
When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their land. Okay, doctrinally he's addressing the children of Israel when they're going to go take over the promised land. Instruction and righteousness for us. When the Lord calls us out of Egypt, the world saves us from under the headship of Pharaoh, Satan. Instruction and righteousness, okay? All right, remember, okay? And shows you and reveals to you the devilment of everything, okay? Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their God, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thus, ecumenicalism today. Well, why, well how, did, how did the Buddhists worship Buddha? How, how did the Hindus worship their gods? How did the Egyptians? Well, 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 wow, that, that seems pretty... Why can't we incorporate that? See? And ecumenicalism, which is a smokescreen, because during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be extreme Roman Catholicism, okay? Extreme Christianity, <laughs> okay? All right? It's going to be a return to the Dark Ages when Rome ruled everything, okay? That's what the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be, okay? All right? But ecumenicalism today is bringing everybody together to build towers on the heaven and make a name for ourselves. Let's bring, well, everybody has their own path to God. There are many ways to God. So says Oprah, so does Francis. Okay, so does the catechism. Okay, at the behest of the Jesuit created, <laughs> the Jesuit created, what is that? Vatican Council II. Okay? Ecumenicalism. Bringing everybody together to build towers to make a name for themselves. Okay? Well, how did they do that? How did they do that? Not supposed to do that. Okay? Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth. Have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters. They have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you. Observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto. Nor diminish from it. So. Roman Catholicism is the perfection. Of the Babylonian Egyptian religion. So everything that Babylon and Egypt did. Which is perfected in Catholicism. God hates. Again, why do some of you, for one day out of the year, want to yoke yourself up with that? Hmm. But enough, enough of that. And speaking of that, uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, which is great instruction in righteousness, except when you want to hold on to your tradition, your Roman Catholic tradition of men, hypocrite, okay? Then this means nothing. Because instruction and righteousness isn't there. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. In the video, at the latter end, this will come and remember this, hinge this, okay? For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. And we'll stop there. Okay? Don't learn the ways of the heathen. You know, going to church buildings. You know, maybe the equivalent in Egypt was you had to go to the pyramid or something like that. I don't know. Okay? And you got to remember what their man Constantine did. He took these... Babylonian Egyptian filth and affixed to them names of, from the Church of the Living God. Okay? That's what Constantine did. Constantine, as that one weird saying is, you can't make 
Christian what is pagan. Uh, that's what Satan has been doing for centuries. Why do you think I'm against Christianity? Okay. Oh, oh, you want the New Testament equivalent of all this? You do, don't you? Okay. I, I, I know, kind of beating a dead horse, but uh, it's needful, brethren. It's needful. Come on, brethren. Let's go, brethren. It's beginning. Okay. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 on to verse 22. The New Testament equivalent to what we just looked at. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All right. Now, let's get to this video. Enough of my hooting and hollering, brother. All right. Now, like I told you, I'm trying to navigate this. Uh, this OBS stuff can be a little confusing, so bear with me, okay? Let's go. Now, oh, 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 wait, before we do this, hold on, let me, see. there is, um, there was a comment, uh, when you look at the comment section, um, of this, and, uh, there's like, how many comments? 179, but somewhere in here, someone commented that if Osiris is a god, why does he need a temple, Right? Or why does he need a, a, a tomb if Osiris is a god, right? And uh, that's somewhere in that comment section. And right away, when I saw that, uh, right away came to mind, yeah, if, okay, if Osiris is a god, why does he have a tomb? It'll be explained uh, in somewhat within uh, what we're going to look at. But you know what came to mind right away? First Kings chapter 18 Okay. <laughs> uh, if he's a god, why does he need to be born upon shoulders? Okay. If he's a god, why does he need a tomb? What came to mind right away? First Kings chapter 18, verses 26 on to 30. When Elijah and the prophets of Baal, it's like, okay, you do your thing to a bullock and call on your gods and... I'm going to call on the name of the Lord, but you guys go first because yours is quick and easy. What I do takes time, okay? And they took the bullock which was given them, uh, 1 Kings 18, verses 26 on to 30, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, little G. Either he is talking, or, is he, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. And see, verse 27, Elijah mocked the false prophets. Kind of like we can do when it comes to these idiot and I'm being polite, charismatics, who think that they saw God. Okay? You fool. All right? But notice how he says uh, he's talking, or he is pursuing, or he is a, in a journey, or per, per adventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. Hmm. Satan can't be in the same place, two places at the same time. He walks to and fro in the earth, Remember, like in Job 1 and 2, okay, remember? So think about that. Um, Elijah is mocking the prophets of Baal, the ministers of Satan, because he knows that who they worship, Satan, can't be in uh, two places at the same time. Uh, you know, he's pursuing, he must be he asleep, must be awake, okay? He's addressing the non-omnipresentness non-omnipresentness of Satan, Baal, okay? 
Very interesting. Verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And prophesying, they were leaping on the altar. I believe this prophesying was the that I, I believe that's what was going on. Tongue talking. Some people beg your pardon, run the minutes. It's a little cold in here. <laughs> Had to swing the open. Some people will, will try to go to the Hebrew and try to tell you that that prophesying is something like by spasmodic, um, unintelligible something or other. Uh, you don't need to do that. But they prophesied until the time of the offering. We know that prophesying does involve speaking. So I believe that verse 29, you are seeing the equivalent of what you see in these wicked, charismatic Catholic churches uh, with the people, uh, blah, 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 you know, your prayer language. Yeah. Prayer language, huh? Like that? In verse 30, And Elisha said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah was like, okay, enough. Enough of your foolishness. Okay, come on. Come on. And note that there was no one that answered or heard. Or heard. But some might say, well, God answers all my prayers and you're a charismatic and, uh, or you're a Catholic and, you know, God answers all my prayers. Who's answering your prayers again, huh? Huh? You know Satan can't answer prayer? Huh? Huh? We, we've talked about this at length. But, uh, I okay? You might be saying, well, I speak in tongues my prayer language, and God answers my uh, prayers all the time, and look, I got a big house, and oh, shut up. I oh, shut up. Shut up. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 on verse 4. Uh, actually, you read Isaiah 66, verses 1 on verse 4. We'll just read for this, verses 3 on verse 4. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed, blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own way. And their soul delighteth in their abominations. All things are lawful for you. You engage in your pagan heathenism because you delight in your own way. You delight in your abominations. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Fear of the wicked shall come upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and cho chose that in which I delighted not. You want the New Testament equivalent? Of course you do. And that's good. That's good. You compare scripture with scripture. Of course, this is, this is easy. Okay, this is easy. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 on verse 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Who is answering your prayers, buddy? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay? So now, all right. So who's answering your prayers? 
Yeah, yeah. But anyway, let, let's get to this video. We're going to be listening to pretty much the 5 minute and 30 second mark and then we're going to skip, okay? These several unexplainable discoveries are being made in Egypt. The reason for this is because the ancient Egyptians as a civilization were so far ahead of their age and time that they made impressive structures and inventions. As a civilization, they were also recognized for their interactions with astronomy and scientific exploits. And some will like to come in with the romanticized idea that um, aliens, <laughs> you know, uh, the big headed, um, the big headed things, which was, I forget what it was, but there will be in the, a video in the description box. Um, even Hollywood movies have hinted that other world life forms came and helped the Egyptians to build the pyramids. Uh, remember these aliens, brethren, people, are devils. Brad, you don't believe there is life on other planets? No, I don't. I believe if there were, God would have told us. What you are going to be seeing maybe one day as aliens coming, they're devils. Devils, okay? Just say it. With each discovery made in Egypt, scientists have to dig deep to find answers. However, their most recent discovery has not only left them clueless, but also scared the whole scientific community. What did they find were ancient Egyptians hiding secrets from the rest of the world? Join us as we explore the new discoveries in Egypt that scare scientists. Scientists have just announced they found the tomb of the Egyptian god Osiris next. The tomb of the Egyptian god Osiris, that whole palabra we just went through, okay? Yeah, okay. To the river Nile. After excavations in some prominent parts of Egypt, scientists and archaeologists moved on to explore the Theban necropolis. The Theban necropolis is an enormous combination of ancient tombs and temples that faced the ancient Egyptian city Thebes, which is now known as modern Luxor. Within these combinations of ancient tombs and temples, archaeologists uncovered an ancient tomb on the west bank of the Nile, which was constructed in the likeness of the mythical tomb of Osiris. It was discovered in Sheikh Abd al Khana, which houses the largest concentration of private tombs in the Theban necropolis complex. Located in Abydos, one of the oldest cities of Egypt, it is where all the highest ranking officials, priests, and prominent people were buried during the New Kingdom era. The New Kingdom spanned from the 16th century BC right up to the 11th century BC. It was ruled by the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties of Egypt. Some parts of the tomb were initially discovered by Philippe Vire centuries ago in 1887, but it was never described or published. And with modern... And I want to stop and bring this up because um, a trademark of the Hermetic people, the Egyptians were, as you saw, building pyramids. And, and I brought this up in conversation yesterday with a brother. Um, the Aztec Indians... Uh, or those in Peru, they had what? They had pyramids. They also did sacrifice of men and took out their hearts and stuff like that and engaged in cannibalism and stuff like that. I believe that the Aztecian Indians and the, the pyramids that you see in Peru and stuff like that, I believe that they are descended of Ham. Okay? And you got to remember... What happened to the Aztecs? Jefetians, the Spaniards came, the conquistadores came and wiped them out with their plagues. And they were, but they had better weapons, but they were outnumbered in sheer numbers of, 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 of personas, people, right? But the plagues that uh, Spaniards brought with them, inevitably. But then again, considering the Aztecs and how they, they ripped people's hearts out and they had pyramids. Could it have been a judgment from God? Hmm? Hmm? I'm, just, I'm just interjecting that, sharing with you uh, some of my opinion, okay? Uh, you know, that's just what I believe. I, I do. I believe that the Aztecs and stuff like that were of Ham because building pyramids is a kind of a trademark, if you will, of the Hermetic people. Okay? Just saying. Let's continue. 
an archaeologist looking around in their thirst for more discoveries, a team of Spanish and Italian archaeologists led by Maria Alvarez Sosa of the Min Project came together Sosa, to excavate its like several chambers Pope. and shafts. After gathering details from the carvings and compositions inside the tomb, the ana- And isn't it interesting that there's an Egyptian phallus, excuse me, obelisk in Rome? You might be saying, Brad, quit pausing it. The link will be for you in the description box, okay? Announced that this had been modeled in the style of the large tomb of Osiris, a god and a huge component of ancient Egyptian legend. The, from there to, And look at all the hieroglyphs on the walls and compare that with what you see in the Vatican. With all the artwork and stuff on the walls and you see these things. People. 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 Discoveries and information gathered about the tomb, archaeologists believe it dates back to either 760 to 656 BC or 672 to 525 BC, known as the 25th and 26th dynasties respectively. The postulation of these periods is based on a comparison to similar tombs that contain Osirian elements. In fact, a clear and popular example is the tomb of Osiris called the Osirian. It is constructed into Seti I's own funeral complex. According to Egyptian mythology, Osiris is known as the god of the dead, the afterlife, and also the underworld. He is usually characterized as having bright emerald green skin with a pharaoh's beard. Also, he is depicted wearing a crown adorned with two magnificent... The two swords, the temporal and uh, spiritual and temporal... The helmet, the Pope wears the helmet of Dagon, a fish. Shh. Pay close attention to this. And ostrich feathers and his legs wrapped up like a mummy. He also holds a crook and a flail, which are signs that show his kingship over the land, just like other ancient pharaohs. Two swords of the Vatican. Well, Brad, that it means it's Egyptian. It began in Babylon. Osiris is widely known as an Egyptian god, and his life events were usually performed as a stage play every year by ancient Egyptians. It is a passionate play that recounts his death and rebirth. Pharaohs and other notable people in ancient Egypt were... And notice how they depict that as more hermetic features. But it's a passion play where they do his death and rebirth. Hmm. We're known to perform rituals relating to Osiris as they believed Osiris can enable them to rise from their dead. Based on Egyptian myths, it was believed that Osiris drowned in the Nile or some other versions of the story account that he was cut into 14 pieces by Set, his brother. Set, his brother. Set his brother. Now, the story goes according to Hislop. That's what happened to um, Nimrod. You do not get that from scripture. That is to be noted. But according to Hislop, that's what happened to Nimrod. Okay? But note the name Set that you heard. Set is the Egyptian god of storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners and he conspired with other people to lock his brother in a box and then threw him into the Nile. After Osiris died and the body was scattered across Egypt, Isis, the patroness of nature and magic, and Osiris's partner set out to find them. They were f Isis. So we have Set and Isis. Isis, a female goddess, fashioned after Semiramis, scripturally referred to the Queen of Heaven, the Roman Catholic Mary, the wife of Nimrod. Found and put back together over 12 days, all parts of his body except for his phallus, which was said to have been eaten by a catfish. The phallus. That, that, wait, wait, wait. Isis then made a replacement phallus from gold, and with the help of magic, brought Osiris back from the dead for a while. Okay, sorry, that was the phallus. The uncircumcised male member. That's what an obelisk is, a phallus. And church buildings have the steeple. 
You have an obelisk at Rome, the Washington Monument, and here we're about to hear about how uh, because of the Golden Phallus, which uh, Manly Palmer Hall talks about, and here in Freemasonry, you see the little white bibs that the Freemasons wear? They'll tell you this is esoteric and exoteric stuff that they do. They tell you that the white bib, the lambskin bib, is because it's a symbol of how they were Masons for Solomon. No. No. The white bib is across what? The phallus. The G in the middle of the sign of the seal of Solomon, which unfortunately the Jewish people have affixed the Mason sign for their flag. Praise the Lord when he gets back. Uh, they're going to, it's going to be uh, the true uh, flag of Israel, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? All right? But the G in the middle of masonry does not stand for God. It stands for generativity or generative principle. Masonry is a sex cult, people. Okay? Controlled by the Vatican, the Jesuit order. Okay? That's why they have the white bibs to protect the phallus. Because they worship the phallus, people. Okay? Now. Osiris was brought back to life. Child, enough to catch up to impregnate Isis with a child. This pregnancy grew to become Horus, the falcon-headed deity associated with king and kingship. But... So, Isis, Horus, Set. Hmm. Back to the tomb, what made it very clear to be Osiris's tomb was that the symbolism of Osiris is very evident that in looks it, like stuff due to all the, the evidence about the mythical Osiris tomb. The tomb has a large staircase about 3.5 meters long with a 4 meter high ceiling at the bottom leading to the underworld. Another staircase leads directly to the Osiris statue, which is at a higher level and isolated on his island. Around Osiris, the statue is an empty corridor surrounding it, which depicts a channel of water and the expected burial chamber below the statue, therefore identifying the dead with Osiris. Archaeologists also explored the funerary room where they spotted carved reliefs of demons holding knives, and they are depicted as guardians which protect the deceased body in the afterlife. The team leader, Maria Alvarez, commented that the discovered tomb is of great importance because the burial chambers contain dead who slept their eternal sleep under the god of the dead, Osiris. Now, they switch gears and talk about uh, Toot Your Own Horn, uh, King Toot Uncommon, or King Tut. Okay, we're not going to go along with that, but Isis, Horus, and Set were mentioned. Why is that significant? Now, bear with me here. Bear with me. Okay, can you see that? I-H-S. Isis Horus Set. That is called the <laughs> Egyptian Trinity. Yeah. Isis Horus Set. I-H-S. But check this out. Oh! There it is. The crown, the builder of temples, the two keys, the flail and the thing in the hand of the Pharaoh, and uh, which, of course, the spiritual and temple, temporal, okay, signifying what the black pope has with the white puppet pope. And there you see IHS, the sign of the Jesuit order. Now, you ask a Jesuit, you ask a Catholic, okay? Most Catholics don't know what, they, what it means, Jesus. You mean the son of perdition? Or the, uh, the Jesus of the scriptures? That's not the Jesus of the scriptures. <laughs> no, it isn't. But, now, and you can look online and you will see conflicting reports about this, okay? IHS, Isis Horus Set, okay? The Egyptian trinity, which uh, Ignatius de Loyola 
said that will be our sign. Okay, that's a satanic symbol right there. They will tell you that it means I, Jesus, H, Hamador, S, Salvatore, which means Jesus, man's savior. That's what they'll tell you because they'll say the I is, uh, I, you know, J, H, Hamador, man, or I might be saying that wrong, but Jesus, Hamador, Salvatore. Hamadan, that's what it is. See, I was saying it wrong. Hamadan. I, uh, Jesus, Hamadan, Salvatore. Okay, I was saying it wrong, forgive me. But they will tell you Jesus, man's savior. That's what they will tell you that means. It's not what it means, brethren, people. It's not what it means at all. It's the Egyptian trinity, Isis, Horus, Set. Roman Catholicism is Satan's church, people. And think about it. Why is it so significant that they found this? Well, because they're trying to bring everybody together so that to bring everybody together under the headship of Rome so that they may be, all be ruled by the volition of a single man, that man of sin, the son of perdition, okay, who's going to be the accumulation of all. And he's going to have the visage, I believe, of the Roman Catholic Jesus, okay? I'll put that aside out of the way. And we got to get back to this here. Got to interact with that. Okay, that worked. But... Why is this so significant? Because IHS, Isis Horus Set, is the sign, the symbol of the Egyptian trinity. And what was the very first doctrine? The very first provable, very first doctrine that the Roman Catholic Church started to teach. What was it? God in three persons. From the beginning of the Roman Catholicism. What did they teach? You can prove this to yourself historically even as well. Roman Catholicism, straight out the gate. One God consisting of three persons. The scriptures does not teach one God in three persons. They teach one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. You and I are made in the image of God. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. The three-person trinity is of Satan. It, descend, it comes from Babylon. Okay? And also, too, also, too, Catholics say there is the heavenly trinity. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Ghost. Oh! <gasps> Oh, yeah, that, take offense, take a gate, uh, gate there, Trinitarian. You Babylonian papist, okay? You Baalite, huh? You're offended by... There, there. The Trinity comes from Satan. But what do they say? They you have the heavenly ah, Trinity, you know, with the old man, the kid, and the bird that goes and poops on you, right? Okay, you got that. But you also have the earthly Trinity. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Hmm? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Isis, Horus, Set. Ah, yes. Yes. And remember, according to Alexander Hislop, Isis married her son. Or uh, Semiramis married her son and brought about Tammuz. So the Egyptian trinity is first Isis the female, then the male, and then Set, the son of perdition. You are seeing with IHS, dear friend, the satanic trinity. And on that, go to Revelation chapter 13. The word trinity, now of course, because it's satanic, but here's your trinity. Here, here's the here's where the scriptures does talk about the trinity. Yeah, Revelation chapter thirteen, verses one on verse four. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, 
and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The name of blasphemy. The name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan. Okay? So the beast, that man of sin, the son of perdition, the dragon, Satan, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority because all this is his, given to him by the Lord for judgment. And when the church of the living God gets taken out of the way, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember, God is omnipresent. He ain't going anywhere. We, the church of the living God, are going somewhere. We're going to be redeemed. Okay, why do you think right now at this present time there is such a push against the redemption of the purchased possession? Yeah. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, this is telling us that the man of sin, the son of perdition, sometime during the time of Jacob's trouble, is going to be wounded. I personally believe someone who knows the truth is going to try to assassinate him. That's what I personally believe. But he's going to come back to life. Yeah, I personally believe and you who get left behind, you'll see this yourself. I personally believe it's when this guy comes back to life, that's when Satan is like the sop, the son of perdition. Uh, when Judas received the sop, Satan entered into him. Okay, I believe personally that when this guy comes back to life, uh, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. I believe that's when Satan is going to actually inhabit that man of sin, the son of perdition. That man of sin, the son of perdition, I believe, I believe at the first, is just going to be a, like the uh, white pope for Sosa, another puppet having all this stuff. But when he gets wounded and brought back to life, I believe that's when Satan is going to inhabit him personally. Okay, that's what I believe. And verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon, Satan, which gave power unto the beast, that man is in the son of perdition, okay? And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now you might be saying, Brad, that's only two. Hmm. Verses 11 out of verse 14 in Revelation chapter 13. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. And we're going to look at this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And I have a correction to make on that. Thank you, brother. Um, we've, we've talked about this. He spake as a dragon. This is what this is whom the scriptures refer to as the uh, false prophet. Okay, this is the false prophet. All right, and he spake as a dragon. And as we have discussed, dragons speak very softly, very smoothly, never bringing their voice above a whisper. And always putting on the facade that they are harmless and meek. But within, they are full of dead men's bones and ravening wolves. Okay? That's how dragons speak. Smoothly. They itch ears. That's why I don't trust people who don't lose their temper. Okay? But! Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which... Dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And how Catholics uh, tie that in, they say, you know, they twist what the scriptures say about how the Holy Ghost will do what, you know, what the Lord says because it's the Lord Himself. But Catholics twist that into the Trinity, okay? The Trinity is vile. The Trinity is evil. The Trinity is satanic, people. Here's your trinity. Okay? The Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit. Not 
one person of a three-person trinity. No! One God comprised of a spirit, soul, and body. We have a spirit, soul, and body as well. We're not God. God forbid. No. Okay? We have God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. We have God living within us. Okay? See how subtle Satan and his church is to teach you this vile trinity? Okay? And now verse 13. And he doeth wonders. Oh boy. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, mocking Elijah, who called down a uh, fire. Uh, uh, you know, if I be of the Lord, uh, let the fire from heaven come down and it consume the captain and the, his 50. Okay? Mocking Elijah. Lying signs and wonders, people. Okay? And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Kind of like the image that was made of Osiris, maybe? So, in Revelation 13, you have the dragon, you have the beast, and you have another beast, which is Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. I have a correction to make. In one of the previous videos, I made mention the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. It does not say the dragon. Okay, I repent of that. I, I, it does not say the dragon. I repent. I said in a video, which one? I don't remember. But I said the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. It's not the dragon. I repent. It's not the dragon. What is it? Well, it is the dragon, but the scripture doesn't say in uh, verse 10, the dragon. What does it say? Here's your trinity. Verse 10 in Revelation 20. And the devil, the devil, the devil, that old serpent, the dragon, Okay, but right there it does not say the dragon. I was wrong. It says the devil. So forgive me. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet, that other beast that came up, who spake like a dragon. Okay. And the devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Again, hell is eternal. The lake of fire. Um, okay, the lake of fire. All right? Dear people, dear people, the Trinity is satanic. Okay? The Trinity is satanic. And this, about the tomb of Osiris, why, well, why is this significant? The tie-ins. Think about it. For ecumenical, you know, Rome. Well, they believed in God. They just didn't believe in the right one. And they made all this stuff talking about our Jesus, but yet they were yet misguided, like they even say of the Muslims and the catechism. Okay? You see how this ties in? This is, this is for future kind of stuff. It's like, well, yeah, the Egyptians, they believed in the true God, but they just didn't know. And they gave us all this culture that we, as Christians, can incorporate. You see? You see, people? But now, now, in this video, we're going to skip to the around the 25 minute mark and this has to be because i remember someone said we're supposed to <clears throat> worship the winter solstice zikhail buddy <laughs> yeah here let's start here 2503 Lightsabers are finally a reality. Oh, you use? This new military flashlight is basically ah, a lightsaber. First, it seems unrealistic and tells us something happened, okay. even though we don't know exactly what. But hopefully scientists will discover that soon. The pyramid of an unknown queen found near King Tut's tomb. 
On the 100th anniversary of King Tut's tomb's discovery, a team of archaeologists discovered multiple coffins, mummies, artifacts, a series of interconnected underground tunnels, and even the pyramid of an ancient Egyptian queen that had not been recognized. As the archaeologists explored further, they discovered her name was Neith. However, Neith is yet to appear in the books of ancient Egyptian history. Due to the unavailability of information about this queen, more work will have to be done to learn about her rule and story. This is why archaeologists keep digging at a site about 20 miles south of Cairo called Saqqara to discover more details. Egypt's oldest tomb oriented to the winter solstice. Here a team of archaeologists found Egypt's oldest tomb built towards the sunrise on the winter solstice. Every year on the shortest day, the sun's rays cover a spot meant to hold a governor's statue of the city. Hey pal, the winter solstice is pagan. You observe days, months, and years, times and years. The winter solstice is pagan. The Egyptians celebrated it. Of Elephantine, who lived at the end of the 12th dynasty of Egypt, around 1830 BCE. The team explained for BCE. Before he was saying BC, and now he's saying BCE. Yeah. Other that to get a perfect orientation with the sun, an Egyptian architect utilized a two-cubit pole around three feet long, a square and some robes to calculate the orientation of the entire chapel and the location of the governor's statue. By utilizing these measurements, the tomb perfectly captured the whole solar cycle related to the idea of rebirth and renewal. The winter solstice is depicted as the beginning of the sun's victory over darkness as the days grew longer while well, the summer solstice generally happened with the beginning of the annual flooding of the Nile River. Both of these events held important symbolism. And if I'm not mistaken, Catholicism, their Estarte, has something to do with the summer Don't quote me on that, but... ...linked to the resurrection of the deceased governor. A geometric miracle tunnel. A team of archaeologists excavated in... Okay. I wanted to play that about the summer sol the winter solstice, which is derived from sun worship. Pagan. Zeke Heil, buddy. Yeah. Enough on that. Enough on that. Excuse me. I I, I that I had to bring that up. That's you know, people. You can't take things that are pagan and try to affix them to the Church of the Living God, okay? And on that, okay, now we're done. Like I said, the link for this video will be in the description box for you, okay? Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18, okay? We're going to look at Old Testament examples of this because we have covered in depth about the New Testament equivalent of not being yoked up with Rome, not being yoked up with the world, uh, uh, to abstain from all appearance from evil. We have talked about that within the New Testament at length. Okay? We have. So we are going to look at some Old Testament examples. Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 and verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. And this is Old Testament. The, the New Testament, uh, be, not, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But what do they do? All things are lawful for me. It's a thing of, shut up. You don't even know what that means. But yes, you are right. All things are lawful for you because you're not being held at gunpoint to abstain from all appearance of evil. Enough. But ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. 
I am the Lord. Now, yes, definitely he's talking about the um, about the Mosaic law, the law of Moses and stuff like that, which we are not to keep today. This is instruction and in righteousness, which we need so desperately right now in these days. Okay? And now go to, of course, Isaiah. Now you might be saying, well, Brad, this is all mentioned in Egypt, but it got its birth in Babylon. Babylon, Babylon, Egypt, Catholicism, Rome, okay? Mystery Babylon is Roman Catholicism, the Vatican. And beware of people who want to say, oh, when they talk, uh, you know, when the scriptures talk about Mystery Babylon, it's not Rome, it's actual Babylon, which is in Iraq. No, it isn't. Even uh, Henry Morris did that. Tried to divert attention from Rome. Anything to see. You go for the head of the snake. The head of the snake. The old serpent. Uh, the devil. Satan. You, you expose him. He wants you. The long slithering body of the serpent. He's got so many parts on that body. To waste your time for runoffs. You go for the head Jack. You go for the head. Catholicism is the Babylonian religion perfected, okay? Is the Babylonian Egyptian religion perfected, okay? Satan must be so proud. Isaiah, Isaiah 30, verses 1 and verse 3. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me. And that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. That walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Instruction and in righteousness. Again, Egypt, the type of the world. Pharaoh, the type of Satan. A type of Satan, okay? Our Lord saves us. He calls us out of Egypt under from under the headship of Satan. Okay? All right? Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. And you see so many people going to Catholicism and bringing in Catholic practices and trying to justify that for us of the Church of the Living God. The Lord rebuke you, man. Isaiah chapter 31, verses 1 and verse 4. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many. Well, if God had a church, it would be the biggest one. <laughs> and Roman Catholicism is the biggest church. <laughs> And in horsemen, because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring evil, and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men, flesh, and not God. And their horses, flesh, and not spirit. Flesh are the horses. Okay? What they do. What does that mean? Their weapons are carnal. That's what that means. Their weapons are carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, uh, casting down imaginations, pulling down strongholds thereof. I just butchered that. Okay? But see, their weapons are carnal. Horses, flesh. They fight in flesh. That's what Rome does. And that's what all the parts of the body of the snake, of the serpent, fight in flesh. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. And their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is open shall fall down, and they sh all shall fail together. You're yoking yourself up with Rome, one of the daughters of the Hua. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. Come out from amongst them and be ye separate, 
Set the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. Okay? For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey. And Satan walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Mm, yeah. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. So when you got people trying to correct and rebuke, uh, they won't take it. Eventually it takes the Lord coming down personally. This is talking about the second coming. Verse 4 is a reference onto the second coming. Because it will get so bad during the time of Jacob's trouble that the Lord himself is going to have to come down and fix everything. Ending Jeremiah. The final admonition that we are going to look at and then we will be done with this video. I got, a, got some people I need to get a hold of. Got some people I need to get a hold of today. Jeremiah chapter 42. Verses 19 on to verse 22. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came and whooped the snot out of uh, Jerusalem. Jeremiah was warning them, submit to your punishment and things will be well. They didn't. So Babylon, king of Babylon, you know, Nebuchadnezzar came, put out Zedekiah's eyes and brought them all to Babylon and stuff like that and um, left some to stay behind. And Ishmael, not of the seed of Ishmael, but he came and uh, wiped out some of the remaining people and they chased him off. And they were left, that were left behind, were scared and they wanted to go to Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt, which the Lord said, don't go back to Egypt. Okay, but they were scared. It's like, let's retreat. And the Lord says what? In Jeremiah chapter 43, 19 under the close of that chapter. The Lord has said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Don't be a dog that returns to his vomit. Don't rebuild the things that you have destroyed. Okay? Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to the world. That's for our instruction in righteousness. This is literal because this is for a different dispensation. But know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent unto me, when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according unto all that the Lord our God shall do shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. They did. They said, Whatever the Lord says, by golly, we're gonna do it. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. Yeah. And now I have this day declared it to you. But ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for nor anything for the which he has sent me unto you. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place whither ye desire to go and to sojourn. Remember Lot's wife? Look behind her because she was missing all that she was leaving behind. Chapter 43, verses 1 and 4. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, the son of Kerah, and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. And he just did in the previous chapter. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, setteth thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. So Johanan, the son of Kera, and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of, e of Judah. And what happened? They went down to Egypt. Even when they said, no matter what the Lord says, we're going to do it. 
But see, they wanted to go down to Egypt all along, and they were hoping that the Lord was going to say, yeah, go down to Egypt, because God loves you. He's all about what you want. And he said, no, you stay there. Don't worry about it. You stay here. But it's like, ah, no, he didn't say that. Yeah, has God said. <laughs> oh, and brethren, we are, oh, people, we're going to see some. Oh, we are going to see some stuff this year. We're just going to, it's getting worse. Let's go, brethren. Come on. It's beginning. Come on. Let's get with it. We got, we got battles to fight before the, the Titanic goes all the way down. Come on, let's go. Doctrines are being attacked more viciously than I can see right now. That, yes, they've always been, but they're being more so right now. That's going to be it for this video. I had a very busy week this week. I'm utilizing both channels. Um, I'm using, utilizing both channels. i got to use them both. Okay? But um, that's going to be it for this video. Brother, thank you. Thank you. Couldn't get a hold of you. Try to. Brethren, right now at this very moment, there are many people who are suffering and hurting. Um, our brother from North Dakota, who is physically incapable of working, may lose everything. Pray for him. There are also brethren who have uh, shared with me information which I cannot share with you publicly because they have not given me permission to do so. And unless they give me permission to do so, I will not. Our brother from North Dakota, he's like, please, you know, pray for him. He really needs our prayers. Um, he's a um, uh, 16 Bible believer, King James 11, something like that. That's his channel. Sorry if I mispronounce your uh, brother Jeff. Okay, he really needs your prayers, and he has given me permission to uh, to to say so. Uh, others, unless you give me permission, I can't. I can't. No, brethren. That right now, many people are suffering, and many brethren are in need. And however you are able, whether it's with that, whether it's with the shoulder, whether it's just being there like Job's three friends before they open up their big mouth, attend to their needs. Attend to our, each other's needs in the way that you can, in the way the Lord has allowed you to. Pray for one another. And pray for us. Please, pray, pray for your servants. Okay? It seems that the things that YouTube was doing to this channel have really, really taken hold recently. Yeah, but so what? So what? The Word of God is not bound. So Anyway, we love you. Thank you for watching this. If you do, there will be links in the description box. See you in the next video.